today. It's really great to have you with us. I am Ruth Katz, co-director of Aspen Ideas Health and executive director of the Health Medicine Society program here at the Aspen Institute. I'm delighted to welcome you to another Aspen Ideas Health 2020 virtual event. While the COVID pandemic has prevented us from gathering in person, we are delighted to continue to host informative and inspiring conversations with leading health practitioners, advocates, artists, scientists, innovators and policymakers. And we couldn't be more excited about our program today, an inside look at the vaccine development process through the lens of the Food and Drug Administration or the FDA. With the urgency to have a safe and effective COVID-19 COVID vaccine available, and with those vaccines being developed at so-called warp speed, interest in understanding the vaccine development process has never been greater. And we've got just the experts, both of whom know the FDA, both inside and out, to help us do just that. So let me briefly introduce our incredible speakers today. Dr. Stephen M. Hahn is the 24th Commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration. He's also a clinician, having trained in both medical oncology and radiation oncology. Prior to joining the FDA, Dr. Hahn served as the Chief Medical Executive at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Before that, he chaired the Department of Radiation Oncology at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine, Steve, my alma mater. Dr. Peggy Hamburg was the 21st commissioner of the FDA. Before that, she was founding vice president and senior scientist at the Nuclear Threat Initiative, a foundation dedicated to reducing nuclear chemical and biological threats. More recently, Dr. Hamburg was foreign secretary for the National Academy of Medicine, and president and board chair of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. She has com recently completed her service with both organizations. Commissioners Hamburg and Hahn will be in conversation with Clifton Leaf, editor in chief of Fortune. He has been a guest editor for the New York Times op-ed page and has held senior positions at the Wall Street Journal's Smart Money Magazine. Cliff is also the author of the book, The Truth in Small Doses, why We're Losing the War on Cancer and How to Win It, which was named by Newsweek as one of the best books about cancer. The founding co-chair of Fortune Brainstorm Health, Cliff has won numerous awards for his journalism and leadership in the anti-cancer effort. A terrific, terrific lineup, I think you would all agree. With that, Dr. Hahn, Dr. Hamburg, thank you both for taking time from your incredibly busy schedules to be with us today for what undoubtedly promises to be a very interesting discussion. And of course, thanks to all of you in our audience for being here with us. We look forward to seeing you soon for our next Aspen Ideas Health event. And with that, Cliff, the Aspen stage is all yours. Uh, thank you, Ruth. Wow, that's uh, so exciting. Just hearing the bios again just makes me uh, excited for what we have for, in store for today. Good afternoon, everyone. It is such a pleasure to talk with both of my esteemed panelists this afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Hahn and Dr. Hamburg for spending some time with us today. Um, Dr. Hahn, let me begin with a question for you. Um, this conversation could not be more timely. Today, after all, is the meeting of the Vaccines and Related Biologic Products Advisory Committee, uh, better known as VRPAC, uh, which is actually a meeting as we speak right now. I listened in this morning. It was about an hour or so of introductions, but I, I, caught, I caught some of the presentations. Um, but the meeting is designed to discuss the process of developing, authorizing, and eventually, with any luck, licensing a vaccine candidate to prevent uh, candidates to prevent COVID-19. Um, this meeting brings together a who's who of vaccine experts, biostatisticians, and others. And the aim of this, I think, is really fundamental to what I hope we'll talk a lot about today, which is the credibility of the process. Uh, Dr. Hunt, just talk a little bit about why it's so essential to sort of open up this process to everybody. Well, Clifton, we, we've seen um, a great deal of vaccine skepticism in this country. Of course, that preceded the COVID-19 pandemic, and that should concern all of us because one of the most significant advances we've had in public health over the years, just look at smallpox and measles, 
has been the widespread um, administration of vaccines. And of course, with COVID-19 and the urgency around this pandemic, the number of people who are dying and of course who, who have had COVID-19 around the world, the advancement of a safe and effective vaccine is of significant importance because that is one way that we will put this pandemic behind us. So we really do have to be concerned about uh, vaccine hesitancy and we do need to make sure that we have confidence because when we do, and hopefully it's when, we do have a safe and effective vaccine for COVID-19, uh, the rollout of that vaccine, the administration of the vaccine will of course be dependent upon people willing to be able to take that vaccine. So transparency around the process, transparency around the criteria for either authorization or approval of vaccine is very important. It's why the FDA issued its guidance for vaccines in June, 9, in June 30th of this year, because we wanted to be clear about the criteria we would use uh, uh, for both uh, looking at clinical trials, so diversity, et cetera, but also the criteria we would use for safety and effectiveness. We wanted to put that stake in the ground, let people know what we wanted to see, how they should design their trials. And then our most recent guidance in early October around the emergency use authorization process, which is a special authority that Congress gave us after 9-11 uh, to allow us to expedite products onto the market. So we wanted to be clear about that because that transparency about the criteria, but also the transparency around the, the process we felt was very important to enhance vaccine confidence. Yeah, I think thank you very much for that good and comprehensive answer. I just, if I could drill down a little bit more into this, because, you know, some of the polling data we've seen are just plain shocking. In the AP Nor Nork had a, uh, a poll in May that suggested that only half of Americans surveyed would, would actually get a COVID vaccine if offered, uh, roughly the same number at the Kaiser Family Foundation. Um, 78% of Americans in, in a recent stat in Harris poll worried that the COVID vaccine process would be driven more by politics than science. Um, and so we're seeing this across the board, Morning Consult um, and others, Gallup has a similar poll. I, I, I'm just wondering how deep this is. And, and, and Dr. Hamburg, I wanna come to you in this on the same issue because this is not a new thing, obviously, there has been more talk about it of, of, of late, given this uh, the prevalence of, of vaccine uh, uh, in our consciousness. But but this has been around for a while. Well, it's it's a fundamental concern about how we communicate to the public and healthcare workers more broadly about important new products. We always want them to have trust and confidence in the process. We always want them to understand uh, what the product is, how it works, and, and who should take it. it. becomes especially important when you're talking about a vaccine where there is a, a need for an individual to you know, take the vaccine to protect themselves or limit um, uh, risk of disease, but it also is a public good. It's a public health measure that's needed for control of this um, ongoing pandemic now and, and to, to limit spread of other serious infectious diseases. So it's been very disturbing in recent years to see the anti-vaccination movement, which has been, in my view, deliberately putting out misinformation about vaccine safety. Uh, and it has tragically resulted in under immunization of um, uh, populations in certain communities and resultant preventable outbreaks of disease, measles uh, in particular, which you know many people don't recognize can be a deadly disease and it can have other lifelong uh, sequelae as well. Um, and the measles vaccine is almost 97% effective. So, so we're seeing that in the background. And then now we are seeing another phenomenon, which is uh, equally worrisome, where the actual trust and confidence in the process and the public health agency responsible for the regulatory oversight is being uh, questioned because of the intrusion of politics and concerns that, that reflect also the fact that the process is being so accelerated and we're even using terminology that can be confusing like Operation Warp Speed that, that suggests something unnatural, manufacturing at risk, which means financial risk of investing to make vaccine before we know whether it will actually be authorized for use. 
But all of that, you know, conveys some sense of our corners being cut. And then you hear politicians saying, I'm going to, you know, make sure that we have this vaccine by such and such a date, whatever. And, and understandably, people start to be concerned. But I think that events like the one today, discussion about the process, laying out what is being done, how it's being done and why, and, and identifying the ways in which there are inputs from outside independent scientific experts all should add to confidence and trust that only vaccines that have met rigorous scientific criteria will actually be authorized for broader use. You know, Dr. Hanna, I, you really, really have a, an information war here, and it's not really a, a fair fight. Uh, you've got sort of things like the Verpac meeting today, and you've got you know statements by FDA and by the government, and and sometimes by the scientific community writ large. Uh, but that's against this overwhelming force uh, of of misinformation and partial information on social media and out there. Uh, you know. How do you combat that? Well, I, th I think Dr. Hamburg's right. Um, we all have to stand together on this because this is not just about COVID-19, although right now that's the urgent situation. This is really about, as a country, do we stand behind science? Do we stand behind the performance of clinical trials? Do we stand behind one of the most important public health measures we have, and that's vaccination? Um, so we have to band together um, and do our best to communicate this. And, and think about the context here. I dare say uh, the American public never had heard of what a data safety monitoring board was before the last several months, or the difference between a phase one and phase three clinical trial. I'm willing to bet that a lot of the medical community doesn't completely understand what a data safety monitoring board does. And yet Dr. Hamburg pointed out some really important issues here. One is data coming from these clinical trials, these late stage clinical trials, they have to to, to hit pre-specified endpoints. So, so they have to, to trigger something that an independent board of scientists and statisticians, what we call a data safety monitoring board, will then look at. And only after that independent review is that information then released to a manufacturer who can then decide whether to apply to the FDA for either an authorization or, or an approval. And then our process, we have great, and Dr. Hamburg knows this, amazing scientists, doctors, nurses, pharmacists who will look at these data, make an initial determination. And I bet the American people do not know that FDA is one of the few regulatory authorities that actually looks at the raw data from a clinical trial. We don't look at a press release. We don't look at a scientific paper alone. We don't look um, at, at uh, collated or summarized data. We look at the data, we make our own conclusion. And then we call in this outside experts that are meeting today and they will help us look at this application and they will give us their advice. That will be transparent, that will be open, and that really needs to be emphasized for the American people because this confidence is so important. I wanna to get to the, vac to the COVID vaccine specifically in just a second, but, but for now, just we've seen, you know, Dr. Hamburg mentioned, you know, measles where we've seen this sort of many outbreaks in the United States. Um, this is an incredibly infectious disease. Um, you know, seven times perhaps as infectious as, as, uh, as COVID-19. Um, it's, it's, and we also have seen things like childhood or, or infant um, um, diseases like whooping cough, pertussis. Uh, you know, again, vaccine controlled. This is something we can sort of put behind us. And yet we've seen, we're seeing these outbreaks. It, it seems as if this is a, a problem that, that really needs to be controlled in itself. Uh, and I'm sure Dr. Hamburg is here, there's no question about it. Um, people should not be, no one should be dying of these diseases that can be controlled by vaccines, that can be prevented by vaccines. And we must, as a medical community, get together on this. We must emphasize the importance. These issues are settled. This is settled science. And these vaccines that have been approved through the biologic license approval process are safe and effective. As Dr. Hamburg mentioned, the measles vaccine and we must get this message out over and over again. It has to be a concerted effort and we must support the science and the medicine. You know, it's interesting, Cliff, because in some ways it's the story of public health being victims of its own success. Public health is about prevention, but when public health is working well, 
and diseases don't happen. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, thank goodness for public health that prevented me from being you know, at risk for this disease. They take it for granted. And in some ways in this country, because vaccines have been so successful and so many of these childhood diseases that used to be devastating to individuals and families um, have been prevented, that they're not taken as seriously anymore. And people think, well, if there's any risk to a vaccine, why would I want my child to have it um, when they're never gonna get the disease anyway? But the sad truth is, if we start relaxing our vaccination standards and, um, and the virus still exists in the world, um, then those individuals, those kids are in fact out at risk. And we, we know that from experience. You look at other countries where some of these diseases are much more endemic and really take a toll every day. And, and, and those populations are much more eager to get access to vaccines. And there, the challenge is, is really making sure that underserved populations can get the vaccines they need. So let's talk for a minute, or for a few minutes, I guess, about the COVID vaccine constructs that you have now, the candidates. Um, we're seeing a lot of novel approaches here. Um, and Dr. Han, you know, maybe if you could talk a little bit about what the, the sort of uh, guidance is for vaccine efficacy. I know that FDA has, has, has upped that uh, threshold to 60%, making sure it's, it's even more uh, effective than the original guidance suggested uh, might be necessary. So I, I think you, you've highlighted one important factor here, and it is a good news story. Although as Dr. Hamburg has mentioned, the wording around it uh, sometimes suggests that corners have been cut when they haven't been. But we have, and I'll use a sports metaphor, a lot of shots on goal here from a variety of different approaches, a couple of different platforms that are being tested. And that's good news. Um, some novel like the mRNA vaccines and some that have been tried and true and tested over the years uh, for, for many, many years. So this is a good news story because we have a lot of different approaches for a very novel virus that we're still learning about every day. Um, our guidance outlined um, in June was a floor for efficacy, and as you probably are, that you alluded to, 50% efficacy uh, for that vaccine. And the reason we wanted to, to sort of state and put our plant our flag about that is that that was the time that these late stage clinical trials were being designed. And as the clinical trials are be des being designed, they, they have to be what's called powered. They have to have enough people in them to actually look for an effectiveness of 50% or even higher. And of course, we all want a highly effective vaccine. If we could get to 97%, that would be great. Uh, but we wanted to establish a floor which allowed the, the trials to be put together so that that could be detected. Now, as you probably know from public information, and I can't speak about individual um, confidential information, but as you probably know from the public information, a lot of these trials have enrolled even more than are necessary to detect that level of effectiveness. And that's a good news story because it not only gives us a database of people who received vaccine and placebo for effectiveness, but also for safety. In our most recent guidance for emergency use authorization, and if, if I have a little bit of time, Clifton, I can point out that that is an authority that allows us uh, to, to look at a medical product and, and assess it uh, based upon the risk benefit ratio during a public health emergency. But it's important to remember that unlike a therapeutic, which goes to someone who's sick with COVID-19, a vaccine is going into someone who's not sick with COVID-19 and therefore changes the risk benefit profile because these are healthy individuals for the most part. So that has to factor in our decision. So our scientists spent a lot of time thinking about how do we assess safety while at the same time doing everything we can to make sure this process is as expedited as possible. Understanding, of course, that we did not want to cut corners. And when we looked back at the last uh, number of vaccine over the last 10 to 15 years, what we found was the sweet spot for that was two months. And so if you could follow uh, subjects in a trial for two months, you could get the vast majority of side effects associated with the vaccine. And if you couple that with a very vigorous, we call it pharmacovigilance, but a follow-up program once a vaccine is authorized, you could be very confident about the safety of that vaccine. Our scientists thought this was the sweet spot. We put it into our guidance. 
it generated a fair amount of controversy, as you can imagine, uh, because we did put our stake in the ground and we thought that this was a great place to be. So that's something that the Vaccine Advisory Committee will be discussing today, those criteria. Our scientists feel very confident about that, and I uh, totally support them in, their, their, uh, in the information they put there. Dr. Hamburg, Dr. Hahn, you know, mentioned the fact that you're giving these vaccines or we, we will be giving these vaccines to healthy people. I mean, that's the whole point. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a challenge still because you have to get populations uh, that you're giving that vaccine to, to be representative of the population at large. And th there's some challenge in that, particularly in the fact that you're going to have to recruit a lot of, you know, much older Americans. Um, which, which often don't get into clinical trials. You will need ultimately pregnant women, um, we'll need children, and, and only one of the vaccines that's being tested now, the Pfizer vaccine, is being tested in children up to the age of 12 or over the age of 12. Um, how do we um, make that transition from um, the sort of traditional group of people that go into clinical trials to recruiting a much larger population uh, to test these, these new vaccine products? Well, it's a very fundamental and important question. And we certainly do want to be able to understand uh, the risks and benefits of these various vaccines in different subpopulations. And there's a lot of reason to think that certain of the vaccines that are in development may work better um, at eliciting immune response in certain um, subpopulations like the elderly, um, which you know, frequently have a, a, a more diminished immune response. So we really do want to have that information. Uh, and we really do want ultimately to have a vaccine that can be available um, across all ages and available to people uh, that have different comorbidities or other medical problems as well. And we certainly want one that, that pregnant women can take. But, but it is being approached in a, in a somewhat staged way. You can't do everything you might want to do at once. You can't learn everything you might want to know um, from the very beginning. These trials, the phase three trials, actually are, are larger than many vaccine studies, although they'll probably be shorter. Um, but uh, that has enabled, I think, uh, a broader spectrum of, of ages uh, to be included. And it, they are including individuals uh, with other disease conditions as well. I think it is important that we start to go down to the lower age groups, but um, as I said, that will be done in a stepwise way. And as we have more experience with vaccines and the immune response to vaccines and our study of natural history of infection as well, we'll learn a lot more about what we call the correlates of immune protection. What should the antibody response look like um, uh, in terms of achieving levels of protection? And that will help us to, to better bridge between different studies and to uh, better understand some of these vaccines as well. So, you know, we're at the beginning of a process that has been, you know, enormously uh, rapid in terms of the normal um, uh, length of vaccine studies dealing with a virus we didn't even know about um, as the year began. So huge progress has been made, but still a lot more we need to study, a lot more we need to learn. Yeah, it's, it's, Listen, it's, if I could just follow it, up on one thing Dr. Hamburg said, and, and of course she hit the nail on the head here. Um, if you look back over the last several years, the number of people who participated in all three phases of development of vaccine trials has ranged from 5,000 to 65,000 with an average of 21,750. And if you look at these trials, as Dr. Hamburg said, we have had over 30, sometimes 40, 45. And so very robust data in terms of number of, of, of people in the trials for the COVID-19 vaccines. And that gives our scientists great confidence. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's been a remarkable achievement. One of the, the challenges of the, of the speed, though, is it, it does make people wonder about, you know, are, are there any corners being cut? Um, you know, in terms of the COVID prevention network, which is helping to uh, recruit people for these trials, they say they need about a million more volunteers just to sign up uh, for potential uh, 
participation in a clinical trial. Bio, um, the, the, the uh, uh, industry group, says that it's tracking 192 different vaccine candidates, 204 antivirals, 364 COVID-specific treatments, nearly 160 of those are already in phase two, about 80 in phase three. Just to kind of get enough of the, of the real population in there, we have to do a lot of more reach out uh, to people, particularly uh, pe Black and Latino Americans who aren't participating at the same numbers and needs. What, what is the FDA doing to sort of reach out to those folks? So we um, have an Office of Minority Affairs um, and Dr. Marx and I, particularly around vaccines, um, have spent a lot of time talking to groups. Um, today, I, I, um, I had an interview with a predominantly uh, African-American uh, publication out of Philadelphia, um, where we are, uh, again, being very transparent about the process, about why these trials are so important, about the importance of diversity. So we will continue that effort and we will partner with others on this. I know the NIH has, has spent a lot of time on this also. I, I do want to highlight one thing you said, Clifton, and I think it's um, an opportunity for us as a nation to look at our clinical trials infrastructure and our clinical trial structure, because if you compare that um, to, to some of the things that have been done abroad, for example, the recovery trial in Britain, um, you know, we, we have a relatively fragmented approach to clinical trials um, and many US, um, uh, many US patients, many Americans lack access to clinical trials. I know in my field of of cancer, um, if, if you can achieve 10% of your cancer patients going on a clinical trial, that's a really good number. And when you think about the urgency of the situation that we've had um, and the infrastructure that we have, this is something that I think we should take a look back on and decide what's the best way to structure this moving forward so that we can get answers as quickly as possible, but make these therapies on clinical trials available to as many people as possible, therapies as well as vaccines. And well, it's been a great Oh, go ahead, please. Oh, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I was just going to also comment. Uh, Steve earlier observed that the public has learned a lot about how um, clinical trials are done and about vaccine research. They also are probably learning to think about whether they would want to participate in clinical trials. And I think we haven't done as good a job um, as a medical community, a research community, um, educating the public about uh, clinical trials, not just uh, how they're done, but why they're done. But now people understand how important it is to really get meaningful answers about whether a product, a vaccine or a drug really works. And the way you get that answer is by doing a controlled trial and not just letting everybody take it a new product and report back on how they think it worked for them. Um, and it's complicated making the decision to go into a clinical trial. And of course there's informed consent as, as part of it. But I, I, I think that it's been an interesting process also watching um, people learn about all of these many dimensions of, of clinical trial research and why it matters. You know, we have a, a couple of hundred people who are listening in at the Aspen Health uh, Festival. And uh, I'm, I'm excited to say we've got a bunch of questions that I want to get to. Actually, I'm, if you don't mind, I'll read one from, uh, uh, from one of our guests. Uh, the virus keeps evolving and those who test positive have many different symptoms. Will the vaccine protect us from the various strains of the virus as it evolves? It's a good question. Dr. Hahn, do you want to? That's a really good question. So um, we have thought a lot about this at the agency. In fact, I'd say several times a week we discuss this and it's an intersection of a lot of different uh, science uh, based facts uh, for this. So while, you know, I first off by saying, as Dr. Hamburg mentioned, we're still learning about this virus as we go forward. How long does the innate or the inherent immunity you get after you uh, have an infection? How long will that last? What immunity is most important? While we're still learning about that, um, what we've seen so far in terms of where the virus is and the, the variations in the virus, we're confident that the current approaches right now uh, will provide uh, protection if the data in the clinical trials show that. So um, we haven't seen anything yet that, that raises alarm bells about that, but we will be keeping a very close eye on that. So Dr. Hamburg alluded to the fact that um, immune correlates, the development of antibodies 
of something that we'll need to look at in our clinical trials. The first set of clinical trials we've made clear from our guidance will have a clinical endpoint, that is the prevention of COVID-19 disease. But in those clinical trials, we will look at the immune response. And in the follow-up to those clinical trials, we will look at how persistent that immune response is. We will look at uh, uh, virus samples, for example, I mean, we, the medical community, and how that protection might translate itself over time. So we'll learn about this as we go forward. Um, we're fairly confident right now about the vaccines and where we are, but really we must absolutely stay on top of this and we must do the science and research to actually answer that uh, question completely. Dr. Hamburg, um, you know, SARS-CoV-2 is of course a coronavirus. Um, like other coronaviruses, MERS and, and SARS and the original SARS, um, or in those cases, the duration of the antibody response was is sort of mixed. We're, we're really not sure how long that antibody response lasts. Um, what do we know so far about uh, SARS-CoV-2, the, the, the virus that causes COVID-19, about how protective it is and for how long? Well, I think we're still learning and, you know, we really need to collect the data to, to answer your question, but it's a crucial question and certainly it will be part of what's uh, looked at in the pharmacovigilance um, studies in terms of looking at the, the, the real world experience uh, with these vaccines and we need to con continue to study the natural history of people who've been infected. There's a lot of reason to think that um, immune protection um, may wane uh, with after infection with SARS-CoV-2 and, and we may see, you know, similar with vaccines that, that there will need to be boosts over time, uh, you know, looking at, at what we know about coronaviruses and, you know, that isn't completely uncommon with, with, with vaccines um, as well. So I think it's, it's a critical question. We don't know the answer yet um, and we need to, to continue to do the studies and we need to be vigilant to the possibility that immune protection will wane. I think it's dangerous that there are some people who believe that once they're, they've been infected and they recover that they'll never get it again. They can do whatever they want. Um, uh, you know, that simply is, is bad practice. Dr. Han, this, this brings me up to, the, to five of the six vaccines in which the sort of US government is participating in some way through the NIAID or, or BARDA. Um, five of them require two doses, um, which um, of course presents a challenge, not just in terms of manufacturing enough doses, uh, doses but, but also in that interim period, making sure that you're protecting someone uh, and giving them a neutralizing antibody response. Yeah, that's top of mind for the agency. And um, if we are to receive, or if we do receive an application, particularly emergency use authorization or a biological license, the typical approval process, this will be something that we will require um, is some mechanism uh, in the pharmacovigilance or other process whereby we are able to keep track of who receives the first vaccine and then some mechanisms to ensure that the second uh, in the series of vaccines is given. It's absolutely critical that we keep track of that and that we, uh, that we follow those patients and that we, or those volunteers or, or the, the, the folks who receive the vaccine and that we're able to collect the information about them. I wanna go back to one thing Dr. Hamburg said, it is so important Clifton, it's really worth emphasizing. This virus is still with us mm -hmm. and we absolutely have to take the precautions that we've been talking about, mask wearing, washing of hands, social distancing, even in the situation where you may have had it and you think you're protected, it's really important that we stay diligent about this and we protect our most uh, vulnerable. And that goes for after a vaccine is, is available. And so just if all of our listeners could help us send that message, it would be critical uh, for, for everyone. We cannot be nonchalant about this and we can't be cavalier about what's going on. If I might, I just want to follow up on the question before, because there's a question from the audience. Should people who have already tested positive for COVID get the vaccine? I think that's a good question. Well, really, int really interesting and very good question. It's one of the reasons that in our vaccine guidance, we did not specify that um, 
individuals had to have a COVID antibody test before receiving the vaccine because we realized that there were going to be many asymptomatic um, folks who had, had received it or had gotten COVID-19 and would might have some innate immune protection. We wanted to make sure that we had data on those folks as well. So that'll be part of the prioritization process um, moving forward. And it may be, and I don't want to prejudge the data or the answer, but it may be that we find as we follow in these trials that the immune response does wane and that someone might need the vaccine. Uh, but all of those factors will go into our decision making and then the handoff that we have with the CDC um, and their committees with respect to prioritization and distribution. So a lot of un unknown questions at this point, but we do know that it is highly likely that people who have had COVID-19 will be in the clinical trials and those data will be before us um, when or if an application comes to the FDA. Dr. Hamburg, uh, Dr. Hahn mentioned earlier uh, about the very large post-surveillance, uh, post-marketing surveillance effort that the FDA is engaging with, with other partners at the uh, federal government. You know, in the six years that you were FDA commissioner, um, you, you could talk a little bit about how many companies, private companies, were sponsors of drugs actually complete their, their post-marketing surveillance. Many of the sort of phase fours never get completed. Um, there are gonna be new tools that we now have through just real world data and just using cell phones and things like that to identify adverse events. But um, you know, how, how good are we about truly identifying um, problems in the, in the sort of post-marketing environment of a, of a new drug or vaccine? Well, it's so important to track these products over their entire lifespan of use. And in fact, for vaccines, there are several different strategies which add to the database and add to our confidence in terms of um, getting access to important information about the products and their use. There is the reporting back of um, individuals and healthcare workers and companies should adverse events occur. And that's something that's done jointly between the CDC and the FDA. There are systems for um, using existing databases uh, to collect information, uh, something that's called the Sentinel um, surveillance system. And that allows you to both identify potential emerging safety concerns and also to query the system if you have a, a, a question about a potential link between a, a product and um, reported uh, uh, problems. And then there are instances where companies are asked to do additional studies, um, either new studies or follow on of participants in studies and report back in a, in a formal way uh, to the FDA. And I think that's what you were referring to and that is important. And, and that isn't exclusively in the vaccine arena, that's with other medical products as well. And um, it is important that we be as rigorous as possible about making sure that those studies get fully done because they're asked to do them for a reason. Uh, and uh, there have been some reports that, that in some instances uh, the enforcement of that hasn't been as, as complete as we would like, but all of that is enormously important. And I think it, it goes back to the, the issues around public education as well, because the public really does need to understand what all of these systems are, because it's, I think, reassuring to know that it's not just a question of approve or not. It's really a, a responsibility that that the FDA has and companies have for this ongoing oversight and, and members of the public can play an active role in reporting back. Yeah, no, I think that's good. Dr. Hahn, several uh, FDA uh, analysts today or, or officials in their presentation seem very excited about this sort of post-marketing surveillance world with real world data and some of the new technology that you have. Could you just talk a little bit about some of the initiatives that will help us identify those adverse events or safety issues, um, particularly as they might affect people with um, 
comorbidities, um, which has been, of course, a challenge, you know, longer term effects, for example, from uh, the response, the immune response to the virus, or in the case, uh, perhaps other reactions with other uh, drugs or, or other medical intervention. Well, this is uh, critically important. And um, we have learned a lot during COVID-19 about the collection of data from a variety of different sources to inform our decision making, and not just from clinical trials, but real world evidence. So uh, the centerpiece of our NEC National Electronic System for Monitoring Safety, um, as, as Dr. Himberg said, is called the Sentinel System. Mm -hmm. And it really operates as an important complement to other data that we collect. Um, it is uh, really also not just integral to our safety monitoring efforts, but an engine for methodological innovation and a, a platform that we will use, have, have used to advance the science of real world evidence. Uh, Dr. Hamburg mentioned uh, databases such as claims data. Um, that is a pretty rich environment for collecting data that allows us, and there's a little bit of lag time there, of course, that allows us to look at uh, insurance claims, Medicare claims, et cetera. We can delve and work with electronic um, medical records um, around the country to also gather data that will complement what we see in the Sent Sentinel system. So um, we think that real world data, real world evidence can be particularly useful for post marketing uh, monitoring of the safety of vaccines. We are ver working very closely with the sponsors, the manufacturers, but also outside stakeholders, groups that are very interested um, in this for, from a variety of different directions to actually make sure that our system is very robust. And just perhaps to put a finer point on this, remember if a sponsor comes in for an, uh, uh, an EUA or emergency use authorization, that is not the same as approval. And so we're expecting, as we said in our guidance, that if someone were to come in with an EUA application, they would also put forward a biological license application. And of course, a requirement for us would be the continuing ongoing effort of collecting data. Um, and it's our job, as Dr. Hamburg said, to stay on top of this and make sure that that does occur. You know, it's rare that you have two uh, people who have sat in your chairs before, a current FDA commissioner and a, and a past FDA commissioner. Um, let's just talk just for a minute about the scope of what the FDA has to do. I mean, we're not only, you not only regulate vaccines and help sort of bring in these sort of critical safety protocols, but you also regulate prescription drugs, both brand name and generic, non-prescription, so over-the-counter over drugs, blood and blood products, cellular and gene therapy products, tissue and tissue products, tongue depressors, bedpans, pacemakers, dental devices, surgical implants, dietary supplements, bottled water, food additives, infant formula, microwave ovens, that one surprised me, <laughs> x-ray equipment, laser products, so uh, mercury vapor lamps, I don't even know what a mercury vapor lamp is, uh, sun lamps, color additives in, food, in makeup, skin moisturizers, nail polish, livestock feeds, pet foods. I mean, this is insane. And I bring this up because your budget is about, you know, $3 billion a year uh, or so, um, which is about half of what we gave to the census uh, for their, their process. It's, it's about um, a quarter of what the IRS uh, spends each year. Uh, this is a very large portfolio and a, a major challenge. And I think part of your jobs ha have been and, and are to, to somehow make sense of all that. Uh, it just seems rather daunting. <laughs> well, Cliff, you actually, in your litany of responsibilities, uh, left out food safety and nutrition, <laughs> uh, the F in FDA, and oh also yeah. um, beginning when I was FDA commissioner, um, the FDA took on you know the very historic and, and important responsibility for regulating tobacco products. So it, it is a huge agency with a, a remarkable portfolio of responsibilities and things that matter to people every day um, and matter in profound you know, sometimes life-saving ways. And also the work of the FDA matters to the health of our healthcare system and the health of our economy. And in fact, to our security as a nation and beyond. So FDA is really truly a unique and essential agency and it has chronically been underfunded. I, I think the budget may be slightly higher than what you said, but I, I, I haven't been following that as closely as when I was actually commissioner but it's, it's been chronically underfunded. Um, uh, it needs 
more uh, staff, you know, it's so important that the FDA have, you know, top notch uh, scientists and other professionals. And it, it really needs to be uh, enabled to do its, its critical job without uh, unnecessary interference from uh, a whole gamut of potential pressures, whether it's um, political or um, uh, commercial or uh, other ideologic um, uh, stakeholders or whatever. I mean, FDA really needs to be enabled to do its job. Well, thank you. Dr. Ahn, I know you have a hard stop now, but I'd love you to answer this question. Is this too much? I mean, should we be rethinking the whole mission portfolio? So um, I just put this in perspective, 20% of what American consumers spend money on GDP um, is regulated by FDA. It touches every American life, as Peggy mentioned, as Dr. Hinberg mentioned, and um, it covers a wide gamut of products. And, and something that I think has been relatively unrecognized during the pandemic, FDA's workload has doubled, doubled during the COVID-19 pandemic. So in addition to responding to COVID-19, our incredible 17,000 plus employees have been doing their regular jobs. We've approved, continued to approve new drugs. We've continued to, to work on tobacco. As you know, September 9th was the deadline for pre-market approval for Dean products a deadline that had been pushed for many years. We've been criticized for that. We met that September 9th was the deadline. Uh, we, we saw um, a significant of applications and we're working on those, but we're fulfilling our statutory responsibilities. Dr. Hamburg mentioned hiring. This year, we will have a net hiring of a thousand plus employees at FDA. In previous years, it was about eight times less, about 153 from FY19. And 54% of those are under a new authority we have called Cures, which allows us to go after incredible uh, folks with really remarkable scientific expertise. So I, I, I think it's my a shameless plug for the agency and what we've done over the last 10 months. These are remarkable people and they continue to work and serve uh, their mission of protecting and promoting the American public health. Um, we could always use more resources. Um, and I am incredibly proud of, of the folks and the expertise that they have. Well, I had to give you at least one shameless plug for all your time here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Stephen Hahn, Dr. Peggy Hamburg. Uh, really a fantastic conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr.